Good afternoon. I'm Shamit Zebrekwe, a fourth year business finance major from Carson, California, and current Associated Students President at San Diego State University. Being a black man, actively pursuing my goal of earning a university degree is a testament not only to my parents' support and guidance, but also to my drive and determination. I'm the oldest son of Nigerian immigrant parents, and I'm also the first in my family to attend a four-year university. To get here and to stay here has meant constantly rejecting the negative stereotypes that were ever present while I matured through high school. My first experience at San Diego State University was being a part of the Harambe Mentoring Program, where junior and senior black students were able to mentor the freshmen and sophomore students. This was my first experience of being mentored, being able to see individuals who look like me and talk like me, attain various leadership positions across campus, and succeed both inside and outside the classroom. And then I got my first job at the Alumni Association, where staff took a genuine interest in my success as a student. And now, as a student leader, I constantly search for ways to create and leave my legacy at San Diego State and within the CSU system. For example, I recently had the opportunity to partner with Student Affairs in assisting in funding for our new Black Resource Center that will be opening up in the spring. And thankfully, through the various leadership experiences and opportunities that I've been presented with, all the positions I've had on my campus, I'm in a position to also become a role model to, the, to other black male students on our campus and become an inspiration to those students who don't know where they're going to be at in, in the years to come. And I call this the lifting as you climb model, continuing to push and pull individuals towards success, believing in those who don't believe in themselves, and becoming influential to others in the pursuit of achievement. Mentors, supporters, and role models. That is how I've made it to where I am today and what I hope to be for others. And when I look at successful black men like Dr. Sean Harper, it inspires me to aspire for more. So please, join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Harper, Executive Director of the USC Race and Equity Center. Let me just say that as an older black man that you inspire me to reach higher and to do more. Um, how am I supposed to follow this guy? Uh, no, seriously, I, I'm, I'm really grateful for the beautiful way that you framed uh, this luncheon. Uh, it's really good to see you all. I am thrilled uh, to be here with you. I am a huge appreciator of what you do here at the California State University for many reasons. Uh, one is because I am now a Californian, um, recently back from a long stint in Pennsylvania, and it's good to be back in a place with a system that is firmly committed itself to leading the nation on the kinds of things that I care about. Secondly, I'm a huge appreciator of yours because I am a byproduct of an institution like yours. I went to a small, historically black university in Georgia, public, uh, and I am a public university kind of guy. I was the first in my family to attend college. Uh, I grew up extremely low income. So I know the consequential role that the CSU plays in the landscape of higher education, not just here in California, but across the nation. Uh, so just know that I am deeply grateful for the work that you do. I also appreciate that you framed this symposium around completion. Um, you know, listen, I grew up as a student affairs guy before crossing over to the dark side of the professoriate. Um, so I care a whole lot about student development. Um, I want students to learn something, but I also want them to graduate. 
right? And I appreciate when we get together and we're able to have focused conversations about each of those things. So perhaps there will be a symposium in your future that focuses on enhancing and improving learning. I think that is really important. Perhaps there might be another that is focused on developing students for the economy and for their lives after college. I think that's important. But I am really grateful that today's symposium and your, your two days here have been very tightly and rightly focused on completion. I think that we have an enormous opportunity ahead of us. Notice that I didn't say that there's a problem here. I don't want to frame this around a problem, but instead around an opportunity for the CSU to lead here in California and across the nation. So bravo to you and to your chancellor and others for very smartly spending this time talking about uh, college completion. Now, let me just say that I framed my 30 minutes of remarks uh, for you today around bold moves. I'm a bold moves kind of kind of dude, right? I, I like when an institution or an organization or a leader like your chancellor makes a bold move. So I want to talk about three additional bold moves that you might make uh, toward equity here in the CSU. Uh, before I do that, let me just say that I thought that this, is, this was a bold move uh, that is worthy of celebration. Um, I read about you in the New York Times and in the LA Times and in Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle and everywhere else that wrote about the really bold move that you made around placement tests and around remediation. When I got to college as a first year student, I wasted a lot of time and a lot of money in a pair of remediation classes, remedial classes that I didn't need. I happen to think that I'm a fairly and reasonably smart guy who grew up to be a tenured university professor, but yet I had to waste a lot of money in remediation because I didn't score so well on a stupid placement test. So I'm really glad that you've made a bold move here to not waste your time, not waste students' times, not waste taxpayer money, Pell Grant money, and other uh, kinds of funds on things that don't count and remediation that students ultimately don't need. And I appreciate that you've also committed yourselves to supporting students in other ways, right, to be imaginative and innovative about things that the CSU might do in lieu of and instead of these remediation uh, kinds of exercises that uh, we have lots and lots of evidence uh, from here in California and across the nation don't work so well and aren't valuable for students. So bravo to you on, on making what I think is a remarkable, bold move. Let's talk about your ambitious goal here. I think that this is a goal that is totally attainable. It's ambitious. It's even bold, right? And I understand that you came to this goal uh, through some analysis that was provided by another organization about what it would take to prepare uh, citizens for work and for leadership in our economy and the role that the CSU has to play in filling that gap. I like that you didn't run away from this number. You didn't say, oh, we can't do that. But instead, you've embraced it. You've taken it on. I see it in many places on your website and in your printed materials. Uh, I think it's really bold of you to not see this as a big, scary number, but instead to commit to it. I actually think this is attainable. But let me tell you what I think, at least from my perspective and from the work and the research that we do at the USC Race and Equity Center will be required for the CSU to actualize this goal in this time frame. Now, to be clear and to be absolutely sure, I'm not suggesting that the three bold moves that I am about to uh, lay out here um, is the only solution. I don't think it's the only way to get there. But I think I want to sort of engage you in thinking about some parts of the student success and college completion agenda that are often overlooked. Uh, before I transition to these, let me just 
articulate a really clear stance that we have at the USC Race and Equity Center. We absolutely do not blame students for sluggish and stagnant and poor college completion rates. We think that they are symptomatic of larger structural and institutional forces. Uh, so these bold moves that I'm about to talk about have very little to do with fixing students, but more about fixing the organizations, fixing campus cultures and climates, uh, and other kinds of factors and forces that undermine student success and completion. The first bold move for the CSU might be, and should be if you ask me, systematically assessing and eradicating racism. Very recently, uh, about a, a year and a half ago, when we were the Penn Race and Equity Center before moving westward, we spent a week on a campus that is a whole lot like many of the CSU campuses. This was a large, fairly large public university that was mostly residential, or mostly commuter, rather. It was uh, in an urban context. It's four-year completion rates were in the single digits. Its six-year graduation rates were also in the single digits, particularly for black students. So we went to this particular university and spent a week trying to understand the forces that were undermining black student completion at the university. Now, I've spent my career in higher education as I mentioned before, first as a student affairs professional and then uh, the past 14 years as a faculty member. And I will tell you that I have a huge appreciation for the research that has made very clear to us that some students do not perform so well and don't ultimately persist through degree completion because their high schools underprepared them for the rigors of college level work. I absolutely buy that explanation and I have an appreciation for that research finding. I also appreciate the research that makes clear to us that many students leave the university prematurely because they can no longer afford to be there. They don't have enough financial aid, they don't have enough financial support. So therefore, that explains at least in part the high attrition numbers. I also buy the evidence that suggests that some students leave before graduating because they just aren't sufficiently motivated. They just don't put in the effort that it takes to succeed and thrive. I think that all of those are reasonably, well, consistently documented explanations in the higher education research. Not so well understood, though, are the ways in which racism and students' encounters with racial stereotypes students' encounters with low expectations from white faculty members, I'm talking students of color here, right? How those things also undermine success and persistence. Not so well understood is how not having sufficient numbers of same race faculty members to serve as, res as, 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 as resources, as, as, as protectors, as role models, um, and, and other factors, how that also undermines sense of belonging and ultimately completion. In this particular case study, there is a, um, a, a section in the article that we wrote from it that we call black students versus white statistics. White statistics would suggest to us that students leave the university for those consistently well-documented factors that I talked about from the literature. The black students that we interviewed for this particular case study offered a different set of explanations for why their peers left in such high numbers before attaining the goals uh, with which they entered. So it would be bold of you to assess in a systematic way across each of your campuses the campus racial climate, the experiences that students of color have in their interactions with each other, their interactions with white peers, with white faculty members and administrators. I think that your goal will be incomplete if you don't understand more deeply 
the racialized realities of students whom you are attempting to graduate at equitable rates. It will be bold of you to take this on as a serious part of your college completion and graduation agenda. I also think that another bold move would be to work as hard as you absolutely can to match faculty and student demographics. In our work at the USC Race and Equity Center, we find ourselves on dozens of campuses across the country from year to year. Almost all of them are predominantly white universities. There's this really interesting phenomenon that awaits us on each campus, where the universities and colleges have committed themselves to increasing diversity in the student body and have reached some levels of measurable success from one year to the next. But on the other hand, the faculty demographics don't match. They're nowhere close, nowhere near. Let me say to you what you say to others on your website and in your printed materials. For instance, on your website, you say that the CSU educates the most ethnically, economically, and academically diverse student body in the nation. I believe you. I think that is a confirmable feature and celebrated feature of your system. In your data report, in which you lay out demographics for faculty, staff, and students, you go on to say, much like the students we serve every day, the faculty and staff of the California State University are exceptionally diverse and talented, making the CSU a special place to both work and learn. I provided here on this slide your student demographics. These student demographics excite me. This is what I think higher education should look like. I think it should match the demographics of the state, the demographics of the, the areas in which public universities are intended to serve. This is beautifully and remarkably diverse. I do want to point out here that just about 25% of your students are white. These are your data. But yet, when we look at your faculty and staff demographics, we see that nearly two-thirds of your faculty is white. That's a terrible mismatch. I wonder, can you do equity without equity? Can you achieve equity in student success, in student support, equity in your college completion agenda if you don't have equity in your workforce? Can you, in fact, achieve equity by also having a stratified workforce with whites occupying disproportionately positions of leadership and authority, both in the administrative ranks and certainly in the tenured professorial ranks, but people of color disproportionately, overwhelmingly occupying positions like groundskeeping, food service workers, secretaries, and low-paid custodial roles. I dare you, in your bold move making toward equity, to take this on as a part of that agenda. Taking on diversifying your workforce, making it mirror and match not just your student body, which I think is important, but also the demographics of our state, of your local context. This is one equity move that the CSU can and should make. Let me connect this to college completion. In my work in research on black and Latino male student success in college, that work has taken me to 44 colleges and universities across 20 different states, studying successful young men of color. It's also taken me to 40 public high schools across New York City, studying college-bound, college-ready, 
black and Latino males who are all now in college thriving and succeeding. Those students describe for me a serious threat to their success when the only people that they see who are like themselves are frying french fries, sweeping the floors, and cutting the grass. It suggests to them that this place is not for my people. It engenders for them an insufficient sense of belonging when they walk into class after class after class and don't have any professors who look like them, who value their cultural histories, who affirm their cultural knowledges, and so on. Those things also affect student success and ultimately completion. Bold move. Take this on. Take on the stratification and the mismatch of the racial demographics between students and the people who work at the CSU. Told you I only brought three. So here's the last. I encourage you actually to take on remediation again. The New York Times and all these other places celebrated you for your abandonment of a particular form of remediation. I was among the people dancing in the streets when you made that bold move. I wonder, though, might the CSU remediate itself, remediate the people who work at it to help them, to help us? I don't work, I work at USC, but to help you actually learn how to do racial equity. Let me say what I mean by that. So here is a really complicated grounded theory model that emerged from a research study that I've been doing over the past five years. I will, in the interest of time, spare you all of the academic details about what this grounded theory model uh, does and says and so on. I just want to sort of abbreviate here by saying that this was a study of graduate students and early career people who work in higher education. And it was largely about understanding what people learn about race and about racial equity and about how to do racial equity in their graduate programs and in their early career uh, stages. Many people enter our field having been socialized in perhaps some really problematic ways and thinking about the racial other. Anybody who watches news or consumes any form of media will very likely be convinced, for example, that all black men are terrible, dangerous, thugs. Well, people bring those notions of who black people are. Or that all Asian Americans, despite the incredible diversity across ethnic groups, despite differences in socioeconomic status, that all Asian Americans are exceptionally well and, and good in science and math. We've all been socialized in particular ways, right? We have been miseducated even to think about particular groups of students in particular ways. I'm gonna fast forward all the way to the end here. Here's the outcome of, of the study. Graduate students who would be professionals and professors in universities tell us that they really don't learn a thing about how to do racial equity in their educational training. Think, for instance, those of you who have doctorates, it still remains the case that one could literally go through an entire PhD program and not take a single course on teaching, let alone complicated, more complex versions of teaching, teaching racially, culturally, and linguistically diverse learners how to effectively deal with racial tension in the classroom, how to make good educational use of racial moments that occur in our nation. Those aren't the kinds of things that people learn in PhD programs. So then we hire them to become professors, and they effectively mishandle those things in their classrooms because they never learned. Remediation is about teaching people things that they never learned, right? 
Let me very quickly here in my final minutes uh, just talk about a thing that we do at the USC Race and Equity Center. It was a series that we started when we were back at Penn that we called the Penn Equity Institutes. It's a virtual, synchronous, four-week experience for higher education leaders in which we teach them things that they never learned anywhere in their educational or professional upbringing about how to do racial equity. I want to just say some things that we're learning from the institutes. We're learning from college presidents, chancellors, and provosts, and deans, and department chairs that, yeah, race is fairly taboo on our campus. In fact, racial avoidance is a cultural norm. We just don't go there because we either don't want to make people uncomfortable or for white people, they don't want to be seen as racist. If they say the wrong thing or make a racial mistake. For people of color, and most especially women of color, there's a fatigue that ensues in having to always be the person at the table who's raising the race question and being mislabeled as the angry black woman. So therefore, it becomes culturally normative to just not talk about race. You cannot do racial equity if you cannot talk about race with your colleagues, with yourselves, and so on. So in the institutes, these higher education leaders tell us that, yeah, we don't really talk about, about race. They also tell us that they live mostly segregated, personal lives outside of work. As an activity of the institutes, we have these 20 higher ed leaders um, who all work on a single campus, do some stop taking of their friendships and their relationships outside of work. And most of them come to understand that they spend their time, most of their time, with people of their same racial group at night and on weekends. I'm not so sure that you could do racial equity by having such bifurcated lives, right? If, you're, if your equity life is only the life that you live, you know, between eight and five, uh, for those of you who work those hours on the campus, uh, instructors and administrators want to be excellent. This ought not surprise you. You are here because you want to be excellent. You are here because you want the CSU to be excellent and successful in achieving its goal. That's something that most folks who work on college campuses want. They also value equity. We spend very little time having to convince college presidents and other leaders who participate in our equity institutes that equity is important. They get it. They understand that it's important. But yet, few of them were ever taught how to do equity. Therefore, few of them actually know how to do equity. So here's the punchline here for your, your third bold move. If you are going to achieve and accomplish equity in your college graduation, college completion imperative, I think you're going to have to teach people how to do it. Most people who work on college campuses do not know how to do racial equity. Yeah, despite, you know, personal commitments, inequities persist. Because very seasoned administrators and faculty members tell us that, yeah, to be honest, I actually don't know what I'm doing. Many of them also confess illiteracy to us. I don't mean that they can't actually read, but that they haven't read. There's a whole literature on how to do equity in higher education. Books like these. I mean, I just like randomly picked a, a, a small handful off of my shelf. There are numerous other volumes that actually provide guidance to colleges and universities on how to do and accomplish racial equity. We have to read those things individually we have to read them as offices and as units and departments and as whole academic schools and as a whole university and 
figure out what from these things are scalable and adaptable to the CSU. What can we learn from these things that will allow us to actually enact the values that we espouse concerning equity? I want to go back to where I started. I think this is totally attainable. I would enjoy seeing you do it. I would even be willing to partner with you in doing it. Me and our colleagues at the USC Race and Equity Center. But you just have to be prepared to make some bold moves. You can't just make some little adjustments around the edges or do those things that only focus on fixing the student. You gotta do some cultural work, some climate work, some work that deals with the racial stratification of your workforce. If you're willing to be bold in that way, I am certain that the CSU will continue to be the talk of the nation. It will be the place to which other public university systems and even private universities look to for leadership, inspiration, and guidance. I am with you as you make your bold moves. So I'll stop here and Sabrina, do we have time for some questions or reactions or critiques or spontaneous applause? Thank you. My question is, um, how do um, chief diversity officers fit into your last bold move? Yeah, so this is an important question. It's one that we think about a lot at the USC Race and Equity Center. Uh, for those of you who didn't hear it, um, how do chief diversity officers fit into um, these, these bold moves, particularly the one around um, learning to do equity? Um, so our stance at the center is that honestly, the chancellor and the president and the provost and the dean ought to be the chief diversity officer for their respective domains of leadership. Even if you have a person who has the title chief diversity officer, it should be the president and the chancellor that everybody looks to for guiding light and for inspiration. Now, that person may not always have the answer because like the rest of us, that person may be a byproduct of his or her own miseducation and underdevelopment. It might in fact be the case that the provost is in need of remediation around these things because she or he never learned how to do them when that person was say an assistant professor of chemistry before becoming an associate professor, then a full professor, then a department chair, then the dean, and then the provost, right? Uh, yeah, that chemist may not know a thing about racial equity, but that person has to be the person that consistently reminds the institution and the organization that this is among our highest priorities if we are going to be who we say we are and if we're gonna do what we say we value. Um, so that's, that, that's, that's one response. The other, is that chief diversity officers can in fact be remarkably helpful in that chances are they know a whole lot more than almost all of the rest of us about these things, those who are serious experts in their fields. I don't mean like the passive ones that some that might have been hired because they're not gonna make any noise and they're more like symbolic appointments and they don't have any power um, and they don't really have the president's ear and the the ear of the provost. I don't mean those. I mean the ones who like are actual like serious experts who have a seat at the table at the cabinet. The people that the rest of the leaders at the cabinet look to with lots of love and lots of admiration and appreciation and high levels of respect in their eyes. Those. We can learn a lot from those leaders. They could help us get organized around learning how to do racial equity. Thank you for your presentation. I'm pretty proud of the CSU and of what we're doing. Me too. I think we do a great job and we can always do a better job. 
So can you point us to some university system or universities that in praxis we can learn from? So I, USC probably not, but you probably know. <laughs> What's that, Shay? Oh, that felt like shade to me. Um, <laughs> now listen, so I, I wouldn't point you to, to USC um, for lots of things. Um, but you know what? I'm going to for this one, actually. We have a provost at USC that has decided he's not going to hire a chief diversity officer. He's the chief diversity officer. Everywhere he goes, he talks about equity. He talks about race. He talks about it in a plain spoken way. Uh, he's also the reason we moved our center from Penn to USC. Um, he properly resourced it, uh, gave us the support that we need, made sure that others around the university understood why we were coming there and what we bring and why and how it fits into the larger uh, strategic imperative of the university. You know, he also holds deans accountable. So every academic school, we have 19 of them at USC, every academic school had to develop a diversity and equity and inclusion plan. This is not a novel thing. People have been doing this at universities for a decade or more. But in most cases, those diversity plants are more sort of symbolic window dressing. They're not real. They don't have measurable goals. They don't have accountability woven into them. They're exercise and window dressing. Our provost empowered each of the 19 deans to develop robust, very serious diversity plans. Then he, along with the team of vice provosts and, and, and others, met with each dean individually after reading their diversity plan. He didn't send them an email. You know, he didn't, you know, like say to them in a cabinet meeting, uh, got your plan, great job. No, he met individually with, with each of them and gave them some very serious, serious feedback on their diversity plans in ways that are just uncharacteristic of most presidents and provosts. I have to just be honest with you. That's not typically how that goes. Um, presidents and provosts often convince themselves that, oh, well, I'm too busy to meet with 19 deans. But if you're going to do equity, and if equity is going to be your thing, you're going to have to meet with these folks and let them know that you're serious. Otherwise, they're just going to, you know, engage in like a ceremonial sort of process of writing a pointless report that will do nothing to advance the institution. Uh, so yeah, that's one great example from USC. Um, I will also, <laughs> sorry, I will also point you to the City University of New York that has a system-wide initiative on young men of color that spans each of its campuses, each of the CUNY campuses. They did that because their data compelled them to do so. When you looked at the data, and you looked at students who were chronically and most notoriously at the bottom of just about stati every statistical measure of educational progress and performance, it was young men of color. So CUNY used those data to justify cre creating a system-wide initiative focused on improving educational performance and outcomes for young men of color. And their initiative isn't just about mentoring, although there's a lot of mentoring built into it. It isn't just about creating a space for young men of color to come together to form community with each other. That's a part of it. That's not all of it. It also includes some very seriously disruptive things in the system that produces bad outcomes for young men of color. So in other words, some of the things that I talked about here uh, today, faculty practices, can't just be about fixing and mentoring students. It has to also be about these other things. And that's also a part of the CUNY uh, system-wide uh, male initiative. All right, one more. Sean, Sean, thank you so much for your 
wonderful, wonderful talk and your challenge to this great university. And um, I believe that we have the administrative leadership, the faculty leadership, the student leadership to move these bold initiatives that you have outlined. I believe that we have wonderful affinity organizations on our campuses. African American faculty, staff, and student associations, and Latino faculty and staff and student associations, and, and others. What, what tips, what advice, what steps would you suggest that uh, is necessary to move organically towards achieving those bold initiatives that you have suggested? Thank you. I really appreciate it. Um, and you know, hearing these very generous um, reactions to my talk from you are especially meaningful because I've long been an admirer of your work and your leadership. So, so thank you for that. First, um, let me let me just say um, that I'm not sure that it can or should be organic. I'm a guy. Okay, so I'm not an engineer. I'm a education and a business school professor. Um, I'm not an engineer. But I believe that these things have to be engineered. They can't just be organic. I think for too long, we've culturally relied on things to happen organically, and therefore the university moves slowly. In this moment, if you are to achieve this goal, you can't move slowly. You gotta move fast. You have to move with intentionality and with tremendous strategy. That strategy ought to include, for sure, activating and leveraging those affinity groups uh, that, that you just described that are on the campuses and understanding that there are members of those groups who are, in fact, experts on theirs and other people of color's lived realities and experiences on the campus. It requires listening without being defensive, without being dismissive, without lying to yourselves and convincing yourselves that, oh, that was just that one Latino person's experience. It's not at all emblematic of other people's experiences here. Institutions convince themselves of these kinds of, it, it becomes habitual, in fact. It's a, it's a habit of institutions, right? To convince ourselves that, yeah, the things that the Latino caucus or, you know, the black faculty group that they're calling for, you know, those things, that's just a rowdy bunch of black folks or Latino folks, right? Um, now, you got to listen. Um, there's tremendous wisdom and expertise in, in, in those groups. So I am grateful that, that you have them. But, you know, really, I, I, I honestly think that it requires, like, some very serious strategizing. You know, when I was talking about those USC equity institutes, um, you know, I didn't share with you, like, the list of modules that we offer in them because I didn't want this to come across as I was trying to sell you something. Um, I'm very sensitive to that, but I will tell you that in the institutes, when a president calls us up and says, we want to do one of these institutes for 20 people on our campus, we give the president a menu of 24 modules and we say pick eight. One of the modules on there is around strategic planning for racial equity. It can't be ad hoc. It can't be a project of just some committee or a project of just the Black Cultural Center or the Black Resource Center, right? Like it has to be an institution cabinet level project. And we, we teach leaders how to create bold strategic moves and actual strategies that are reasonable and attainable um, as, a part of, as a part of the institute experience. I'm a firm believer in, in that because folks tell us at the end of it that, yeah, we would have been going nowhere fast had we not actually engaged in a process like this. Um, so yeah, listen, you all have been really, really terrific. Um, I meant what I said when I said that I really believe in the CSU. I am absolutely thrilled to be back in California for lots of reasons. Uh, one of them is to be a close partner with you. 
um, if there are ways that we could be useful and helpful to you uh, at the USC Race and Equity Center, uh, see, that's a good thing that's happening there at USC. Uh, feel free to be in touch with us. Uh, we, we'd be delighted to be helpful. Uh, best wishes to you. Well, Sean, uh, thank you for your thought-provoking uh, keynote. The, uh, there's much there for us to consider and to act on. You know, and you actually, I didn't know if that Romney was going to ask you to defend your institution. Um, and I have a several trustees here with me today. And so, you know, if you just if you take a look at how you're supposed to organize these three letters, uh, <laughs> re-scramble the USC into CSU. You could be the 24th campus and, you know, <laughs> you could come on in. You already got the no tie look down, so you're halfway there. Yeah. I just, just have to get your alphabet soup correct now. <laughs> but seriously, thank you so, so much for what you had to say. And I trust for all of us that these um, few days have been enjoyable and productive for you and that you've uh, gained ideas and from your colleagues and inspiration from your colleagues and from our speakers and that you'll take this back to campus and share it in your conversations with your colleagues on your campus who couldn't be here and to implement the innovations that make sense for what you're trying to do specifically in each of our campuses. Now look, I, I recognize I'm the last thing <laughs> between now and you getting out of Dodge. So that's a great place to be on the program. Um, so let me try and make these 15 minutes worth your wait. So let me suggest first that for this initiative and for our efforts to be really successful, we must also track our guiding values, our vision, and our mission, the North Star, if you will, and answer the question, why? the why. What stands at the core of what we do and why does it matter? Why does empowering student success matter? Why does eliminating, eliminating equity and achievement gaps matter? Why does earning a degree matter? No, this isn't the quote attend CSU until 2025 initiative. It's the graduation initiative. Why does the CSU matter? Now these are core questions that should and are guiding our efforts throughout the California State University. So why do we matter? Well, we matter because we know that the future of California will be defined not by what new innovation helps us move or eat or heal or trade or communicate more easily, nor by what movie or TV show or video game takes the world by storm, nor will we be defined by whatever new gadget Apple or Google or whoever uh, decides to discover and to market. Now those outcomes are tangible evidence, tangible products of a successful future, no doubt. I don't mean to be at all dismissive of them. But they won't define, they won't determine if we will share a successful future for the Golden State and therefore, as Sean so aptly pointed out, and others, and therefore for the nation. The only thing, the only thing that will determine our success in the future is education. And specifically, equity in educational access and achievement. Where CSU is renowned, absolutely renowned, for who we graduate, not who we exclude. Let me say that again. We will be renowned for who we help earn a degree and graduate, not who we leave at the door 
or lose along the way. Sean, that's bold. And that's the California State University. Now let's not obsess on these graduation numbers. They are indices of the underlying complexity of our efforts and our endeavor. And they do have utility uh, in, expl in explaining to the public and to the press and to elected leaders about how we're doing. So we have to be mindful of these numbers, graduation rates and the like, but we should not obsess on them. Now we are committed to the success and the future of a rich diversity of students. With that commitment then comes the inevitable outcome that we will have a distribution of time to earn a degree. Now listen, when you think about time to degree and numbers of degrees, the curve goes up and to the right. There's very few who earn a bachelor's degree in less than three years. A few actually do earn it in three years, with kids. Um, but you get to four, and then you get to five, you get to four and a half and five, and five and a half and six, and it just, that curve keeps going up, right? So there's a distribution of curve, and America picks the four-year rate and the six-year rate and the transfer rates that are two and four and all that stuff, and those are the numbers that get thrown around a lot, but it's really a distribution. And the goal of this initiative is to move that entire curve up and to the left. So if you're on the three and a half year plan, you're gonna get out in three. If you're on the five year plan, you're gonna get out in four. If you're on the six year plan, you're gonna get out in five and a half, et cetera. That's what this is about. We want all students to succeed. Because when you embrace a diverse student body, you embrace the idea that there is a diverse array of life embedded in those young men and women, and not so young men and women. So I believe that at CSU, students can graduate in a timely manner that fits their reality and leave us whole. It is not a dichotomy of one or the other. You can leave this place whole in a timely fashion around the reality of your life. And that's what we need to do, and that's what the California needs us to do. It is up to us to adapt to our students. It is up to us to adapt to our students, and as speakers mentioned yesterday in particular, not force them into our model of one size or two sizes fit all. Now, I want us to think a bit about where we came from. You're each part of something really profoundly important and remarkable. You know, our first campus was founded in 1857. We know that as San Jose State today. Right, Rami? Yeah. All right, you're safe, dude. <laughs> and our most recent campus to open was Channel Islands. It opened to freshmen in 2003. Now to put that in context, we started in 1857 with our first campus. The, the other system in California, University of California, waited 11 years to start something in Oakland and then a few years later, the first campus in Berkeley was in 1873. So don't forget where we started. Sorry, number one. Um, and we became a system 57 years ago. And our motto is as profoundly apt today as it was in 1960. Vox, Veritas, Vita. Voice, truth, life. Think about that. An educated citizenry indeed drives our society, our economy, our democracy. And with voice and with truth can lead a rich and productive life that serves beyond self. That's the California State University. That's why, that's why we're here. Now our university is a vehicle of social mobility. You hear that all the time. I actually think that's not true. I actually think we're a vehicle of social ascent. Because mobility is just moving around. Ascent is moving in a directional way of improvement. It's a vehicle of equity and of social justice. 
You know, Senate Chair Miller yesterday asked us to, or earlier this morning rather, asked us to understand and think deeply about the multifactorial elements that characterize what student success means to a student. And I agree with that consideration. But I also opine that the social ascent part of the equation, the moral imperative, the equity imperative that we bear is that civil right of social justice that requires access to and through the university to a degree or a credential. Access to and through to a degree. Because it's the degree and the additional skill sets of being work ready then that allows a person to have a career, which in today's world will be multiple different jobs. So there's work ready skills on top of the ABCs of accounting or business or uh, biochemistry and the list goes on of teamwork, cultural competence of science and financial and environmental literacy, of uh, being effective to communicate in person and through technology to be comfortable in the space of ambiguity, to uh, understand and follow ethical behavior, to be self-actualizing, ambitious and confident, to seek success and to learn how to manage failure and to speak up on the moral issues of our times, which changed. We've been speaking up and out about immigration and DACA and the environment. That is what the CSU graduates can do. And I'm proud to be one of them. You don't have to go far to see examples of CSU's revolutionary, revolutionary ethos, the Californian spirit, if you will. Many people in this room would not be here without their California higher education nor would the millions of students and alumni who have their own California higher education story. As I mentioned, I'm one of those. Without Diablo Valley Community College and Cal State East Bay and Fresno State and UC Berkeley, all public institutions in California, mind you, I, as a first-generation student from the Bay Area, uh, would not be addressing you uh, here today, let alone be a chancellor of the most uh, remarkable, consequential, and transformative university in this country. And by the way, President Trump, I'm an immigrant, just in case you're watching. <laughs> now, we know that California faces a drought of a million bachelor's degrees by 2025, 20, 2030, and that our plan, our strategy, and our tactics, and some of the additional things that Sean and others have asked us to think more deeply about will help more students graduate with high-quality degrees sooner. And this will help alleviate that bachelor's drought now, you may know that uh, over half the teachers in California earn their credentials through the CSU, and that's been a point of pride currently and historically for the CSU. But you may not know the following, that more than half of all of California's bachelor's degrees in agriculture, public administration, engineering, criminal justice, and business come from the CSU. And on occasion are highly regarded applied doctoral programs in education, nursing, and physical therapy, and soon audiology, step in to offer doctorate degrees where there's a workforce need for that level of educated folk. Now, the impact of CSU is magnified by the fact that we serve a student population, as Sean pointed out, that resembles California. Some two-thirds of the bachelor's degrees earned by Latinos in California come from CSU. Two-thirds of the bachelor's degrees earned by Latinos Latinas across California, public and private, come from the CSU. That's a point of pride. And the system, like our state, has no ethnic or racial majority. Uh, the largest plurality, again, is among the Latinx. Now look, I'm approaching five years with you here, and I want to ask you to join me in thinking about just these last five years. We have grown our student body by about 10% about 42, 43,000 students. 35,000 of those students are Pell students, low-income students. Now, 35, big numbers, numbers sort of blur. Let me put a face on this. The increase in Pell students in the last five years exceeds the total enrollment of Pell students across the Ivy Leagues plus USC, UCLA, and UC Berkeley. 
Just our added students in five years exceed their total enrollment of students. That's a point for me of enormous pride. Our bachelor's degrees in these five years, the number earned per year has gone up 21% in just five years. From about 82,000 bachelors earned a year to a little short of 100,000 now. And also the masters and the doctoral and teaching credentials have gone up. That growth in the student body exceeds the total enrollment of six of our existing campuses. Sonoma, Humboldt, Bakersfield, Maritime, Monterey Bay, and Channel Islands. So said another way, in five years, we've added six campuses of students without adding a campus. God damn, that's good, come on. <laughs> so in addition to serving California, we enjoy the mantle and we accept the responsibility to help lead the national movement to rethink and refresh how we use best practices and research and student outcome data to better serve our students. So getting back to the question of why, that is why we matter. We're driving our socioeconomic success today, tomorrow, and into the future. We're empowering the next generation of teachers, engineers, nurses, farmers, business leaders, and we're sure ensuring to the best of our ability that all Californians, regardless of their background, they have the intellect and the willingness to do the work, can earn a degree from the California State University. And we're really, really leading a national effort to rethink how we go about higher education, focusing on these issues I just discussed. But there's one more why. And it's one that I've actually found myself personally thinking about uh, perhaps more than I should. But too bad, I'm the chancellor, so I get to do that. And that is the, the times we're in now the times that we've all been in the past and the times that our students will be in the future. It seems now that there's an incredible set of forces that are trying to separate society. And being a life scientist, and I had a centrifuge in my lab uh, to separate, well, I won't tell you what I was separating, um, bodily stuff. Um, these centrifugal forces that separate society are social and political and environmental educational and economic and faith. So why does a university like ours exist? I submit to you that it is the only remaining structure in a democratic society that is also designed beyond the ABCs of accounting, et cetera, designed as a centripetal force to bring society back together, to bring us, regardless of what we're studying or doing research on or discovering or inventing, to find that common humanity of where we have common interests and finding those differences and learning about them and understanding them and not tolerating them but actually respecting them. And so the other why of the California State University is to be this centripetal force to counterbalance the increasing centrifugal force that is pulling us apart today. That perhaps is the most profound why of why all this stuff matters. So make no mistake, this responsibility, our commitment to it will require innovative thinking, bold action, risk taking, courage, tolerance of mistakes. And I know that you and your colleagues on the campuses are doing much of this work that's driving us forward to this ambitious goal. So let me close by saying thank you. Thank you for coming to Long Beach. Thank you for sharing your ideas and best practices. Thank you for all the work. And you do and on the world-class faculty and staff that are back on your campuses and every day reach further this opportunity for our students going forward. And thank you then for all what you're doing to help build a, a, a sustainable California, sustainable economically, socially, environmentally, and politically, and educationally in the future. And it's because of you that I'm absolutely confident, just as Sean mentioned in his observations of us from afar, that we will succeed, that we will execute our bold vision and reach our goal of serving California's future. So thank you for listening to these remarks. Thank you for participating for these, day, these last few days. Thank you for the work you will do tomorrow and every day thereafter. We are now adjourned. Thank you.